Hello, everyone. I am Rene Najera. I am the Director of Public Health for the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. I am welcoming you to another public health chat from the college. My guest today is Laura Vargas from Peer Support Community Partners. She is the Director of Outreach Programming, especially around grief support for people who have lost somebody due to the opioid epidemic. The um, epidemic in Philadelphia has been severe, to say the least. Uh, deaths there in, in 2022, the data, the latest available data, 1,400 deaths, up 11% from the year before that. 80% of those deaths included fentanyl. But as you may know, people use different substances and just about any of those substances can cause an over those. So while we are focused a lot on opioids, a lot of people are not using per se, they're using other substances that just happen to be contaminated with things like fentanyl that lead to accidental deaths from overdose. And Laura, thank you so much for being here today. One of the things that we were talking about as we were setting this up is that, yes, we all know there is an opioid epidemic. It is costing more than a million lives a, a year in the U.S. as a whole. As I said, about 1,400 deaths in Philadelphia, probably going to increase for the 2023 year. And there is a lot of issues around that. But we seem to forget as the public and in public health and in medicine, we seem to forget those who are left behind, right? These deaths are horrible, probably 99.9% .9 preventable. And you have people who are left, family members, loved ones, friends, relatives, co-workers who are left behind by the folks who unfortunately pass away. And so this is where you step in in your organization. Can you tell us a little bit about the scope of the problem and what do you do to confront it? Yeah, thank you so much for having me and for all the work that you and your team do. So the problem, as you mentioned, is very big. When we're getting over 100,000 deaths each year, it's hard to quantify exactly how many people are left behind. For some people, that might be five close family members. For other people, that might be their entire community, people they went to elementary and middle school with. And so we're talking really big numbers, certainly over a million new bereaved individuals each year as a result of the overdose crisis. And despite these numbers being so large, the biggest issue that we have here is the stigma. People do not get the support that they deserve, the support that they would get from any other cause of death. And so we have these individuals who are bereaved by something that in many cases is sudden, it's unexpected, they weren't prepared for it, they weren't planning for it. And then they have to deal with the added stigma of feeling like they can't talk about it, feeling like they can't seek where it's feeling like people are judging them because this happened. And so what we do, peer support community partners, is we actually focus on peer-based group support. So by training, I'm a clinician, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. However, the work that I'm doing right now is on expanding peer group support. And what that means is having support from individuals who have been through the experience themselves. And I believe that's very important when it's a stigmatized death, when individuals are grieving deaths due to substance use because of that isolation that they feel, the lack of understanding from others around them, to be able to bring people together to support one another and to realize that they really are alone, that there are other people who've been through this experience who can share that pain with them is so powerful because really the main thing that that is getting in the way of people's grief is that isolation, that judgment from others. So if we can move that away, then we can start building all the other support that could be helpful in their grief journey. And we often don't realize that if somebody passes away from an overdose, it may have not been because they had a substance use disorder. Personally, I, I had a friend went to a party to celebrate graduation from a master's program. Somebody was passing around something to make them feel better during the party, and they unfortunately overdosed from fentanyl and ended up passing passing away. And so these are people in our lives that all of a sudden they're not there and you don't, you may not realize it, but you do grieve as human beings. We want these people around us. They're our friends for a reason. Right. And then you start that grieving process. And like you said, the isolation, the isolation is probably one of those things that you don't realize you're, you're going through. Right. And then as you said, the stigma, which is for so many public health problems, we face stigma, right? We face a fear of being judged. And that stops people from reaching out for help if they have a problem and people around them, if they also want to help with the problem, they might think, I don't want to in some way continue your or enable your use of substances when that might not be the case. One of the things that I wanted to ask you was in, in these peer support programs, how do you measure, if, if you can at all, how do you measure success? Yeah, I think it's different for each person. For some people, it's a matter of celebrating the small victories. They are finally able to take a shower get out of bed, get back to work, things like that. They kind of small day-to-day -day activities that become really difficult when you're grieving. For others, it might be allowing themselves to cry in public, to speak about their pain, 
And when we're talking about peer grief support programs, measuring the success, it's really a matter of are people coming back? If it's, for example, a support group, are people sticking around and participating from week to week or month to month? That tells us they're getting something out of this, whether it's just listening, because a lot of times for people, it's really scary and daunting to talk about these difficult feelings. We're not taught as a society to talk about our grief, to talk about our pain. And so for some people, they start off by going to these groups and just listening. That's what we encourage. Just listen. Somebody might say something that you're already feeling and maybe you didn't have the words for it. And so for somebody who might start off as just a listener and then they start participating a couple months down the road, they start sharing their experience. I would consider that a huge success for others where it's a matter of kind of this has become everything to them, support groups and individual support and whatnot. Can we add in other things that bring you joy? That might be a measure of success, too, of can we find the balance between the grief and the support that we're looking for that's so important, but also building other things in life. So it's really different from one person to the other because everybody's grief is so unique and everybody's grief journey is so unique and so individual. And I assume that while it remains an individual way of dealing with this, there's also cultural differences, right? Have you observed those and what are those? Absolutely. That is something that's huge, something that we're looking at a lot, cultural humility. So I, for one, I'm Latina, I'm Colombian, and I can see how the way that I was brought up in speaking about grief, speaking about our struggles, it was very much at home, very much don't bring it out of the house. And so when we're talking to people about go to the support group, go to the support group, we're not accounting for the fact that might not work in other cultures. That might not be something that we're open to that we're comfortable with. And so we have to offer options for everybody, a little bit of everything from online support. Here's a blog that you can read if you want to be really private about your experience, you don't want to talk to anybody about it. But still, you can see just some blogs and you can see some posts on social media that kind of give you that sense of comfort or understanding. For other people, it's one-on-one support. For other people, it's finding faith-based support. I think that Something that was focused on a lot in the past decades or so was support groups, which are wonderful and for so many people are great, but for so many communities that just doesn't work. Or if we're having support groups and it's all one demographic and somebody else wants to join and they don't see people that look like them or that have similar experiences, they might not continue with that. So we have to make sure that we're including communities in building the response for grief support and not just assuming that we know what's going to work. Likewise, professional mental health support for so many people, that's great. That's what they're looking for. Again, some communities, that's not okay. And so what what are the options? I think that's the most important thing, a little bit of something for everyone. And how does somebody recognize that there is something going on? You mentioned lack of sleep or sleeping too much, those little changes, but how does somebody say, there's something going on there. I probably need to reach out. Grief in and of itself, it's the natural human response to loss. So there's nothing wrong with that. And that pain, it's only natural. If, if you've had this relationship with somebody and all of a sudden they're gone, we're not going to function the way that we did before. And for some people right then and there, they want the support. Even if nothing is clinically wrong, it's just a matter of, this is really hard. I want to share this with somebody, whether it's a loved one, a friend or a family member, whether it's a professional, whether it's a peer, whatever that might be, somebody might identify. And you could look at the on every clinical measurement and there's absolutely nothing wrong. This is normal. This is to be expected, but they still want that support. For other people, they might try pushing past this. They have other kids they're taking care of. They have busy jobs, things like that. And so they're not seeking support. And that's okay too, if that's how life is going and there's no time for that. But for people where that might be the case, it's a matter of seeing what has changed. How am I functioning in my day to day? And again, being really careful to know that we're not going to function the way we did before the death. That's just impossible. Our life has been flipped upside down. So being really gentle with oneself and compassionate and knowing there's never anything wrong, but or signs that you might need additional support. You might even need medical support for some people, especially when you talk about the sleep, the appetite, things like that. Those are ones where, you know, if somebody feels like this is really getting in the way of being able to function on the day to day, and it's not just a standard of, oh, I'm crying every single day or I'm sad really 
every single day, but if something more than that, it's always worth checking in with a physician, checking in with a clinician and just adapting how things are going from one day to the next. Last year, when I was looking into Philadelphia and its experience with the opioid epidemic, I came upon a YouTube video of when you were working for the Philly Health Department and had this garden, this memorial garden for people who had been lost to the opioid epidemic. Can you tell us a little bit of a, the story behind that garden and, and why it was necessary to build a garden and have it out there? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Philly Heals, the program that I was running, really started from scratch. I had started working at the medical examiner's office. It was the first position focused on supporting the families of individuals that had died as a result of substance use. And that started in 2019. Hook off because there was such a need for this type of support in the city. There were so many deaths, so many individuals and families left behind to grieve. And because it started so grassroots, developed a really strong relationship with the individuals that we were serving, built a little team out, ended up being five of us, and they're still doing wonderful work. But through kind of that very small, very connected growth to the community, there was actually a woman that we were working with, a mother whose son had died, who asked, why aren't there memorials for these kids, for these individuals? And we see these memorials, these war memorials all over the place, but we're not seeing anything. And the way she put it, she was like, this is a war in our country when we're losing 100,000 individuals each year. And so she mentioned that a year and a half before, and it's something that kind of stuck with us. What can we do to show individuals that the city does realize what's happening, does realize the magnitude? How can we provide a space for hope and healing? And how can we add some sort of activities in there, some sort of learning opportunities? And so that kind of all came together through a while. And what we decided to do was to have this pop-up overdose memorial garden where people could come and have that space if they wanted to just have a space where they felt connected to their loved one. They could tag a flower with their loved one's name. It was all purple, which is the color for overdose awareness. And this was all opened on Overdose Awareness Day and carried on throughout the month of September, which is recovery month. And so during that time, what we did was we actually offered a bunch of different events and activities, again, to give people a place to go to, to get that support, to connect with one another, to meet other individuals who were also bereaved by this. And so we had, a, again, a little bit of something for everyone. We had some artistic event, which included making collages and painting and drawing. We had events for children who had been affected by this. We had more kind of educational workshop type things. We hosted a couple of support groups there. A lot of different things so that people can really just come to this space, know that. And we chose a really front and center location right in the heart of Center City so that anyone, even those who weren't bereaved who, you know, weren't speaking to us and learning about it could stumble upon it. That was the other thing. Let's have people walk through and ask, what is this beautiful thing? You know, we wanted it to be this really beautiful garden so that people could start to change the image that they had of the overdose crisis to also start chipping away at that stigma when people came in and saw the number of flowers. We had over a thousand flowers there to represent the over a thousand Philadelphians that had died in the year before. And so being able to have conversations with people, especially visitors, tourists, those who would just come through, allows people to start having these conversations and to know that it's okay to talk about this. These are real people with real lives, with real loved ones who are left behind, who are grieving them. They matter. These aren't just numbers that we should be ignoring. Yeah, indeed. I, 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 I can do nothing but agree with, with what you've said. Ms. Vargas, if somebody wants to uh, get in touch with you, how do, how, do, how do they do that? What's your website? What's your organization again? Yep. So the organization, it's Peer Support Community Partners. Our main project right now, it's based in Massachusetts. It's through the Massachusetts Bureau of Substance Addiction Services. And so that project, it's called FATOD, which stands for Support After a Death by Overdose. And that website is just www.fatod.org. My email, it's laura at fatod.org. So that's L-A-U-R-A. And anyone can reach out. I think this is really important to, to talk about, to keep exploring, to make sure that it's not just limited to these geographical areas where we do have these services and support, but to know that this is something nationwide worldwide. So people, even if they're in communities where programs like Philly Heals, programs like SADOD don't exist, they can still reach out and we can find and see what might be out there in their communities. And likewise, one of the 
few good things that came out of the pandemic was this ability to do remote work, mm -hmm. to offer support groups virtually and whatnot. So anyone's welcome to, to reach out. And we'll have all that information in the show notes. So thank you so much, Ms. Vargas, for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. Again, this is a, a topic that we have the two sides of the coin. On the one side, people with substance use disorder, or even without having a disorder, they just used a substance and they happen to take the wrong dose and overdose and accidentally died. And then on the other side, people who are left behind wondering, really experiencing the pain. There's a saying, right, that the dead don't know that they're dead. It's the living who have to live with the pain. And certainly that is something worth of addressing and looking into. I thank you so much for your time. Don't forget to follow us, like, and subscribe so we can continue to share these important public health topics with you. And check out our website, collegeofphysicians.org slash events for any upcoming events to do with medicine and science and the historical building downtown Philadelphia. Thank you, Ms. Vargas. Have a good rest of your day. And to everybody listening. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much.